Um, okay, so this is a screencast on simple harmonic motion. What is simple harmonic motion? Um, it's any periodic oscillation where the restoring force is directly proportional to the displacement. Or we can also say any periodic oscillation where the acceleration is directly proportional to the displacement. But what's also important is that the acceleration or the restoring force are both acting in the opposite direction to the displacement. And we'll explain what that means a little bit later on. One of the best examples of simple harmonic motion is a mass on a spring, so we're going to use that. So we can see the mass on the spring here at the moment. Um, it's at what we call its equilibrium position. That means that it's not uh, extended, it's not contracted. So from Hooke's law, um, we can say that the force is directly proportional to the displacement in the opposite direction, and that's what I was talking about before. So this minus sign right here, uh, tells me that the, the force is in the opposite direction to the displacement. And similarly, the acceleration is directly proportional but in the opposite direction to the displacement. And because it satisfies these conditions, therefore we can say we do have simple harmonic motion. So if we take that mass and we stretch it out to some new position, uh, and we're going to say the displacement from the equilibrium position is x, and this is fully stretched out, so we're going to say that this is the maximum possible displacement. We're going to call it x max. So, at x max, what do we know about the mass on the spring? Well, there's a force acting in the opposite direction to the displacement. That's one of the defining features of simple harmonic motion. And because force is directly proportional to the displacement, if the displacement is at a maximum, then the force. So at f max, or sorry, at x max, we get f max and we also have an acceleration and acceleration is also at a maximum if the force is at a maximum then the acceleration must be at a maximum so we'll call that a max what else do we know well we also know that the velocity at this point is zero so if we're taking the the spring and we're pulling it out to a maximum displacement and then we release it from that position at the moment that we release it its initial velocity is going to be zero kind of like dropping a stone from some height we say its initial velocity is zero so we're releasing the spring, its velocity is going to be zero. And as it oscillates back and forth, it's going to accelerate, reach some new velocity, and when it reaches that maximum displacement again, every time it reaches a maximum displacement, it's going to stop for a second and its velocity is going to be zero. So at, at a maximum displacement, the velocity is zero. So if we take another example then, where we've released the mass and it's traveling back towards its equilibrium position. It still has a displacement from the equilibrium point, but it's going to be some value x, um, and we're going to say x is less than x max. So it's still got a force, a restoring force that's accelerating it towards equilibrium, but uh, the force is less than f max. And it's still got an acceleration, but the acceleration is also less than um, the maximum. But now its velocity is no longer zero. Its velocity is some value greater than zero. And the velocity is going to increase until it reaches the equilibrium position. And then because the force is going to change directions and keep, the force is always towards the equilibrium point because it's a restoring force. So as soon as it passes the equilibrium point, it's going to start to slow down, okay, until it reaches this position over here. And then it's going to stop for a second again, and then it's going to travel back in this direction. So its velocity is going to be a maximum um, at the central position, and we'll see that. So as the, as the mass travels back to its equilibrium position, what's its displacement at this point? Now its displacement is zero. So at x equals to zero, what do we know? Well, the force is zero. There's no force acting on it. Therefore, the acceleration must be zero. But velocity is a maximum. Um, so often when we talk about simple harmonic motion, it's very useful to uh, talk about the uh, phase angle of a mass moving at simple harmonic motion. And if you look at this example, you'd say, well, there are no angles involved here. This is a mass that's moving from left to right and left to right and back and forth. So there are no angles here. But um, if we compare this type of uh, oscillating mass to circular motion, we see that there's some similarities. So if we imagine a point on a circle, a point moving around a circle, and it's going to move through uh, all these various points on the circle and so on, like this. And we can see that for this point moving through the circle, it is moving through an angle. And this, this is also moving in simple harmonic motion. We're going to see why a little bit later on. Um, but it's more obvious to see that this is something moving with an angle. It's moving through 360 degrees every time it makes a full circle. 
So if we were pl to place a screen behind that circle and illuminate this little point dot as it's going around the circle, so we're going to put a screen over here, what would we see? We'd just see the shadow of that dot and it would appear to be moving up and down. So as the point moves through 90 degrees on our screen, what would we see? We'd see the point move up to some new position on the screen, some higher position. And then as it moved through another 90 degrees for a total of 180 degrees, we would see that dot move back down on the screen, back to its original position. And as it moved through another 90 degrees, we'd see it move down further to some lower down position. And as it moved back to its original position on the circle, we'd see it move back to its original position on the screen also. So what we would see on the screen is the point just oscillating or moving up and down and up and down, very similar to a mass on a spring. And so we can essentially say that when we think about a mass um, oscillating on a spring with simple harmonic motion, we can treat it uh, as a type of circular motion in that it will have a phase angle. So even though there's no angle to look at as the mass is moving back and forth, it's still moving through a phase angle if we consider it um, as circular motion. So we're going to plot out how that mass moving on a spring or around in a circle um, looks like. So if we plot its displacement in meters against the phase angle in radians, well, at this point here, this is going to be the equilibrium position. So that's uh, got no displacement. At its equilibrium position here, it has no displacement. And then as it moves through 90 degrees up to this new position up here, we're going to say on our screen, we would see it move to this position, right? At some maximum displacement. And as it moves through the circle at 90 degrees, we call that pi over 2. 90 degrees is pi over 2 in radians. So we plot a point, and we're going to call this, uh, this is some displacement, it's going to be a maximum displacement. So the, the, the mass, or whatever it is that's oscillating in simple harmonic motion, will have a maximum displacement at pi over 2 in this case. And then as it moves through another 90 degrees to this position, it will have moved to this point on our screen, and if we graph that, that's at 90 degrees, or pi radians. And it moves through another 90 degrees to this position, it'll have moved to this position on our screen, and if we plot that, that's a maximum displacement in the opposite direction, so down here, at 3 pi over 2 radians, or in other words, 270 degrees. And finally, as it moves back to the equilibrium position, at 360 degrees or 2 pi radians, we plot that point. So if we join those dots in a curve, we get a wave. So you can see that something traveling in simple harmonic motion travels in a wave format. Or maybe it would be more correct to say that we can interpret that movement as a wave. So uh, when we talk about simple harmonic motion, it's useful to talk about this quantity here, omega. And it's a measure of how fast the mass in the system is moving through the angles. So how fast is it moving around in a circle? The faster that it goes around the circle, then the faster it moves through an angle. How quickly does it take to move through 90 degrees, or 180 degrees, or 360 degrees? Or how fast is the mass oscillating back and forth on the spring? So it's a measure of how quickly the mass moves through an angle in radians, theta, with respect to time. So ordinarily when we talk about velocity we talk about how something moves through a, a, through a displacement with respect to time. This is angular velocity or angular frequency. So it's a measure of how quickly something moves through an angle with respect to time. And we can also say since in one full cycle it would have moved through a phase angle of 2 pi radians, 360 degrees, the time that it will take to do that is one period. Okay, so looking down here, we can see that it has moved through an angle of 2 pi in one full wave. The time taken for one complete wave is called the time period, t. And we can also say, because t is equal to 1 over f, we can say that the angular frequency is equal to 2 pi f. So that's important. We're going to put that in a box. And we can also say that theta equals to omega t. So just by rearranging this, Part of the formula, 
we can say that the phase angle theta is equal to omega times t. So let's say we want to be able to plot out its displacement at any moment in time or for any phase angle. Um, let's pick a point on the circle here and we'll say it's moved through an angle theta. And if we looked at it on the screen it would be at this point here. So it will have moved some displacement from equilibrium x and on our screen that will be this distance x. Now if it were to move through 90 degrees it would have moved to this position at a maximum displacement. And what do we call the maximum displacement? Well, we call that the amplitude. Remember, the maximum displacement of a wave, this value, is called the amplitude. So we can plot that out on our screen as well. Now you'll notice from this that the amplitude equals to the radius of our circle. And that's going to be useful for us too. So we want to plot out uh, the displacement x, or we want a formula that would allow us to calculate the displacement x. So, what is x equal to? Well, here we have a right angle triangle, and from that right angle triangle, from um, trigonometry, we can see that x equals to a sine of theta. But theta equals to omega t, so we can say that x equals to a sine of omega t. And that's important, so I'm going to put that into a box. So now we have a method of uh, calculating its displacement at any moment in time. As long as we can calculate the um, angular frequency and we have the time, we can calculate its displacement, assuming we also know the amplitude. So now we'd like to be able to calculate its velocity for any moment in time. Well, uh, velocity is just the change in displacement with respect to time. So we can say v, the velocity, is dx dt. So v is going to equal to, or we're going to have to differentiate, a sine of omega t with respect to t. So first of all, I'm going to put in my a. I'm going to leave that for now. And I'm going to differentiate sine of omega t. What do you get when you differentiate the sine of an angle? You get the cos of that angle. And then you have to differentiate the actual angle itself with respect to t. So we get omega, and we multiply everything by that. So we get that the, the velocity is equal to a times omega times the cos of omega t. And we're going to put that into a box. So now that we have the displacement and the velocity, the final thing we want to be able to calculate is the acceleration. Well, the acceleration is the change in the velocity with respect to time. So now we're going to have to differentiate this with respect to time. So a is going to equal to, I'm going to leave my a omega for a second, and I'm going to differentiate cos of omega t. So what do I get when I differentiate the cos of an angle? I get minus, so I'm going to put my minus sign in front of everything, I get minus the sine of that angle. And then once again, I have to differentiate the angle itself with respect to t. So I get omega, and I'm going to multiply everything by omega again. So I'm going to get a omega times omega, and in other words, I'm going to get minus a omega squared. So I get that the acceleration is equal to minus a omega squared sine of omega t. And I put that into a box. Now, these formulas are only relevant when the displacement starts at zero. So our displacement here started at zero, at the equilibrium position. Um, in other words, the wave that we get from that type of motion is a sine wave. So these formulas are relevant when we get a displacement starting at zero or when we have a sine wave. So we're going to look at the opposite scenario now. And the opposite scenario is when the displacement starts at a maximum. Actually, no, we're not going to do that. Sorry, I'm going to save that for a little bit later on. Um, we have so far calculated velocity and acceleration. So what we're going to do first is we're going to find a function which will allow us to calculate the maximum velocity and maximum acceleration for the system. Um, and so what I have here is a copy of the same graph that I had on the previous page. So once again, this is a mass oscillating in simple harmonic motion where the displacement starts at zero. Okay. And as we said before, theta equals to omega t. And the maximum velocity is going to occur at the point where x equals to zero. You remember from the first slide, 
uh, velocity is at a maximum when it's at its equilibrium position, so when the displacement is zero. So where on this graph is the displacement at zero? Well, we'll get Vmax at a couple of different points, at um, theta equals to zero, at theta equals to pi radians, and at theta equals to two pi radians. At all these points, the velocity is going to be at a maximum. So we have our formula for calculating velocity, and if we substitute any of these angles in for omega t, and remember from up here, theta is equal to omega t, so the angle is equal to omega t. If we substitute any of these 0, pi, or 2 pi in for theta or omega t, then cos of omega t just becomes either plus 1 or minus 1. And you can check that. The cos of 0 radians, pi radians, or 2 pi radians gives you either plus or minus 1 depending on the angle that you use. So from that, we can say, therefore, the magnitude of the maximum velocity is going to equal to a omega. And that just gets rid of that plus or minus one. So we're not interested in whether it's a plus or a minus. We're just interested in the magnitude of the maximum velocity. And we're going to put that into a box. And then we're going to look at where do we get a maximum acceleration. Well, again, from the first slide, acceleration is at a maximum where the displacement is at a maximum. So where is the displacement at a maximum? Well, it's at these points here, at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 radians. These are the points where we get maximum displacement, and therefore the points where we get maximum acceleration. So if we use our maximum acceleration formula, and we substitute in these values, pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2 for omega t, Again, this just reduces the sine of omega to plus or minus 1, depending on which of those angles you use. And once again, we're interested in the magnitude of the maximum acceleration, so we can get rid of that plus or minus, and we can just say the magnitude of the maximum acceleration equals to a omega squared. And we'll put that into a box. And once again, this is with a scenario where the displacement is starting at 0. So now we are going to talk about the, the opposite scenario, where the displacement starts at a maximum. So I'm going to use my circle again, but this time I'm going to put my light source, my lamp, up here. My screen is going to be down here, and we'll see how that makes a difference. So we're going to start at the same position over here on the circle. And uh, the, this time, uh, when we look at it on our screen, it's going to appear down here. Remember, our screen is down here now. But this time, it's starting off at a maximum displacement. And we'll see that as, as it moves through the circle, so as it moves through 90 degrees, on the screen, it moves in this direction, back towards the middle, back towards the equilibrium point. And through another 90 degrees, it moves back to a maximum displacement. And then through another 90 degrees, it moves back to equilibrium. And through another 90 degrees, it moves back to a maximum displacement again. So this is what we mean when we say that the mass in the system that's oscillating is, is starting off with maximum displacement. And we call the maximum displacement, remember, the amplitude. So let's see how that looks differently when we graph it out this time. So once again, we're going to have a graph of displacement with respect to theta. We're going to fill in our, our different uh, phase angles. But now, this time we're starting out over here at a maximum displacement. So on our graph, at zero angles, we have to start out at a maximum displacement. And then as it moves through 90 degrees, it moves back to a point of zero displacement at the equilibrium position. So at 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, it will have zero displacement. As it moves through another 90 degrees, or pi radians, it will have a maximum displacement again. At 3 pi over 2 radians, it will be back to its equilibrium position at zero displacement, and at a full 2 pi radians, or 360 degrees, it will once again be at its point of maximum displacement. So now we plot out that graph, and we get a different type of wave. We get a cosine wave. And what difference does that make? Well, it makes quite an important difference, because if we once again try to uh, derive a formula to calculate the displacement at any moment in time, uh, let's do that. So we're going to choose this point on the circle up here at an angle theta, and at this point right here, it will have moved some displacement x on our screen down here, which is this displacement x. 
And if we take that as a, as a right angle triangle, where once again, this is the amplitude, then we can see that in this case, x is going to equal to a cos of theta. And again, because theta equals to omega t, we can write that as x equals to a times the cos of omega t. So now we want to get the velocity, so we have to differentiate that with respect to time. I'll put that into a box first, that's important. So the velocity in this case, when we differentiate it, well, remember, what do we get when we differentiate cos? We get minus sine. So this time the velocity is going to equal to minus a omega sine of omega t. So we're going to put that into a box. And similarly, if we differentiate the velocity with respect to time, we get that the acceleration is equal to minus a omega squared cos of omega t. So you can go back to the previous slide and compare how each of those three formulas are different because we started off at a point of maximum displacement. So we can say that these are, these are our formulas when the displacement equals to a maximum, or starts, uh, sorry, starts at a maximum. And in other words, we get a cosine wave. So this wave that we get is a cosine wave. So depending on the question that you're given, you need to decide whether your system is starting off oscillating at a point of zero displacement or a point of maximum displacement. Or does your wave, which represents simple harmonic motion, does it look like a cosine wave like this? Or does it look like a sine wave on the previous slide? And you're going to use that to determine which formula you use for um, displacement, velocity, and acceleration. But let's check if that affects our formulas for maximum velocity and maximum acceleration. So Vmax is going to be, once again, at the point where the displacement equals to zero. Where does displacement equal zero? Well, in this case, not like on the previous slide, but in this case, Vmax is going to occur at pi over 2, where displacement equals zero, and again at 3 pi over 2, where displacement equals zero. So if we substitute those into our velocity formula, we get that Vmax equals to minus a omega times plus or minus 1. So once again, this uh, sine of omega t is just going to reduce to plus or minus 1 when we fill in either of those angles. And again, we're just going to say we're interested in the um, magnitude of the maximum velocity, so that's just going to be a omega. Put that in a box. And similarly, if we do the same for the maximum acceleration, where is acceleration a maximum? Well, it's wherever displacement is a maximum. So at these points, at 0, at pi, and at 2 pi. So if we fill in either of those um, angles into our acceleration formula, we get that the maximum acceleration equals to minus a omega squared times plus or minus 1. So once again, this cos of omega t will just reduce to either plus or minus 1. And once again, we're interested in the magnitude, so we get that it's equal to a times omega squared and we put that into a box. So our, our formulas for maximum velocity and maximum acceleration haven't been affected by uh, whether the system starts out with a displacement of zero or at a maximum displacement. The other thing that we have to consider for our, our system uh, oscillating at simple harmonic motion is the energy stored within the system. So if we take our diagram from the first page, uh, where the spring, the mass on the spring, has been extended to its maximum displacement. And it should be obvious to us that there's energy stored in that spring. There's elastic potential energy. And from Hooke's law, we know that we can calculate the uh, elastic potential energy in a spring using this formula, a half times kx squared, where x is the displacement. Now, the total energy in the system is going to equal to the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. And we can say, uh, represent that as u equals to pe plus ke. So at x max, do we have any kinetic energy? Well, the spring isn't moving, its velocity is zero, so no, it has no kinetic energy. So at x max, kinetic energy equals zero, therefore the total energy is just equal to the potential energy stored in the string. So therefore, it's going to equal to a half times k x squared, where x is x max. What do we call x max? We call that the amplitude. So the total energy in the spring is going to equal to the maximum elastic potential energy, in other words.
So we can say that the total energy in the system is equal to a half k a squared. And then as we release that spring, um, some of the potential energy, the total energy, is going to remain the same, but some of the potential energy is going to be changed into kinetic energy, and vice versa. But from the law of conservation of, of energy, we should know that, that that total energy value u is going to remain constant throughout the motion. So we put that into a box, that's an important formula to use. And then we take a, another scenario where we've released the mass on the spring and it's now got some displacement from the equilibrium less than x max. So the spring is moving with some velocity towards the equilibrium position. So once again, we can say that the total energy in the system is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. So we can represent that with each of the formulas for those. So we get a half kA squared is equal to a half kx squared plus a half mv squared. Now, if I rearrange this to get the kinetic energy by itself, I get that a half mv squared equals to a half kA squared minus a half kx squared. And if I factorize all the stuff on the right, I get that a half mv squared equals to a half times k on a squared minus x squared. And then I can cancel out my halves, and I can get v squared by itself by dividing the everything on the right hand side by m. So I get that v squared is equal to k over m times a squared minus x squared. So this is going to be useful for calculating the velocity, but I can't calculate the velocity right now. I have to get the square root of this. So I have v squared, so I can say v therefore is equal to all this. v is equal to root k over m times the square root of a squared minus x squared. But, something that we haven't covered in this screencast, is that omega is equal to the square root of k over m. Therefore, we can rewrite this as v is equal to omega times the square root of a squared minus x squared. And that's an important formula, so we put that in a box. That's another way that we can calculate the velocity of the mass uh, in simple harmonic motion. So that is your screencast on how to derive the sort of important formulas for simple harmonic motion. And how and when each of those formulas should be used. And hopefully it also gives you a sort of a good uh, understanding of simple harmonic motion as well.